So I'm, we're expecting lots of questions. That's why we're starting early. Um, my name is Brad Jorn. Uh, I've been at Precision Planting for two and a half years. I came here, I was at Purdue for 26 years as a professor of agronomy. And then I went into private industry in a company that I didn't enjoy very much. And then I came here two and a half years ago and it's like I'm in hog heaven with everything that we have going on here. Best company, best ag company in the world as far as I'm concerned. Uh, Tony Bockwell is uh, gonna be speaking to you as well. He is an agronomist in Canada. I've known Tony for probably about seven or eight years. And so when I started here, I was kind of the only agronomist working on the radical agronomics platform. And I told Dale that there's no way that I can do this by myself. And so we finally convinced uh, Tony to join the team. Uh, he's gonna be providing you a lot of insights about how you can potentially get involved in building this database so we can make you know, nutrient management more understandable and precise. And so our presentation today is gonna be, first I'll be talking to you um, about why the Radical Lab is a little bit better lab than the commercial labs from a consistency standpoint. And then Tony's gonna to talk to you about how we take that data and how we'll help you build a database so you can make better decisions. Is this thing pretty loud? I can move this down. I don't know. All right, so, um, so I'm gonna talk to you about soil analysis, talk to you about the Radical Lab. So I, I hope I'll convince you that the Radical Lab is the best soil testing lab in the world. The problem with that is Without crop response data, it's just another lab, right? Our, our data might be more consistent, more precise, more repeatable, but it doesn't help you make a better decision if you don't have crop response data to interpret your analytical results in order to make a better decision. And so then Tony's gonna to be talking about the crop response data set that we're building and how you can potentially get involved. So, I'll probably do more demos than slides, but uh, so when I think about how does the Radical Lab improve your soil test results? First of all, Radical Labs analyze a better soil sample, okay? Then they do a better job of analyzing that sample. So when I talk about, you know, what do you mean by we analyze a better sample? Okay, so <clears throat> how many of you have been to soil testing lab before? Okay, a few of you. So basically, you know, you take your soil cores, put them in a bag, ship them to the lab. First thing that happens is that soil sample is dried and then it's run through a hammer mill, right? And this is what your soil sample looks like. So in the radical lab, <clears throat> you don't have a soil bag, we have a geotube. And with the Radical Lab, we take a moist soil sample, okay? And so this sample is much darker colored than this sample, right? Because it's got moisture in it. Plants don't grow in this soil, they grow in moist soil. So our analysis is always on moist soil. In the Radical Lab, this entire geotube is put in, is pushed into the radical lab, and then a slurry is created. So it's one part soil, three parts water. And so just think about it as going into a blender. And then once that sample is completely homogenized, then we extract a subsample of that for analysis. So that means the entire geotube is, is basically getting sampled, subsampled for analysis. In a commercial lab, once that soil's been dried and ground, you take a two gram scoop, tap it three times, and then this is what is analyzed, right? So that automatically took a subsample of your bag and that's what's gonna get analyzed. Did that two gram scoop represent this bag? Maybe it did, maybe it didn't. So that's a big difference. <clears throat> and so, this is a big difference between the Radical Lab and commercial soil testing labs. 
All of the soil testing labs in the Midwest use this scoop. Okay, so your soil sample is not actually weighed. It's actually scooped and assumed to be two grams. So I need myself a volunteer. Jake, you just got volunteered. Okay. All right, Jake, we got three different soils here. This is the process. Scoop that soil, tap it three times, and then scoop that off. God, it feels like I had too much coffee this morning. And then we're dumping it in there, okay? So what is that? 2.15. Okay, 2.15 grams. Okay, so that's about a 7.5% error compared to a two gram that it's assumed to be. So why don't you do these next two? Sure. Yep. Look at that tapping technique. I was pretty impressed by that. All right, dump her in there. What's that one? 1.84 grams. Okay. So one's a little higher, one's a little lower. See if you can do a little better on this one. Okay, so about a 10% error. So these are not, thank you, Jake. We'll give Jake a hand. All right, very well done. Okay, so this is what happens in a soil testing lab, right? You automatically introduce an error on weight. In the radical lab, because it's all computer controlled, we're always pulling an exact mass of soil, and it's the exact same mass of soil for every soil. And so if you imagine if you had a, a real heavy sand soil, I mean, I, I didn't like pick like end members here. Um, this one actually usually weighs two grams, but it didn't today. Um, you can get values, I'm not talking about organic soils because that's not fair, but if you had, you know, a real fluffy silt loam soil with high organic matter, say 6% organic matter, you might get 1.6, 1.7 grams. If you have uh, a sandy soil with relatively low organic matter, maybe one, one and a half percent, it might be 2.5 grams. It's a huge error that you introduce when you're not weighing the sample, okay? Um, when it comes to the extraction and things like that, the radical lab is all computer controlled, right? So I just wanna run through a couple comparisons. In a traditional lab, the chemical extractants are added manually, you know, with a pipette. Doesn't make it not accurate, but it is prone to human error because it's how good you are at using that pipette that will deliver the right or the wrong amount of extractant. And then it's shaken manually, and, you know, for the Malik 3 soil test, it's a five-minute extraction. And at five minutes, you stop that extraction, and then you pour that sample into a filter paper in a funnel, and then you start letting that extract filter through the paper. So I'm gonna do that here too. <clears throat> so here's a, here's a sample, okay? It's been extracting for a little while here, but. All right, so pour that in there. There's the soil. Here's another one. These are the same three soils that we just uh, analyzed or weighed, okay? So, Joe, do you have a, uh, a phone on you with a timer? All right, you are gonna be our timekeeper. Okay, so when you have a five minute extraction and then you pour that sample into the filter paper, until that extract is going through the filter, it's still extracting the soil. So it's a five minute extraction followed by filtering time. And what you're gonna see here, hopefully, is that not all soils filter at the same speed. So, Joe, 
as soon as this hits 10 mils, just record the time and just stick them right in front of there, okay? All right. <clears throat> so this is a problem. With the radical lab, the chemical extractants are added automatically with microflow, and you'll see that technology when, when you visit with Reed and uh, Wendy later. And the extraction is stopped automatically, again, under computer control by microflow. So it's not like if, if somebody sets a timer for five minutes and they're going to get you know, coffee break or a bathroom break or something, they come back and that extraction is not exactly five minutes anymore. And then, then you filter where in the radical lab that sample is pressure filtered. So our difference in extraction time, it, it might vary from maybe 20 seconds to 30, 32 seconds. So there's like a 10 second differential between an easy to filter soil and a hard to filter soil because it's done under pressure. And so this is really important. You know, this whole idea of a, of a moist soil analysis is really important for potassium. How many of you have difficulty with interpreting your potassium soil test? Nobody? You're all happy? Okay, there's one. Anybody else? You don't? Yes, okay. The problem with potassium is that the soil test is really impacted by how you treat that soil. So if you look at this graph, on the x-axis, okay, the bottom going across, this is your moist soil test result, right, in parts per million. On the y-axis, that vertical axis, that's the ratio of if you dry that soil sample and take that analysis and divide it by the moist analysis. Okay, so when that ratio, when it's one to one, that means that if my soil test was 200 when it was moist, it would also be 200 when it's dry. Okay, when it's a value of two on that vertical axis, that means that if my soil test when it was moist is 100, my soil test when I dry it is 200. And if it gets up to three, that means if it's moist, it's 100. If it's dry, it's 300. So you can see when you have a low soil test value and you dry that sample, the soil test value goes up. When you get a really high soil test value and you dry it, the soil test value goes down. So you're taking a moist soil and you dry it, you artificially inflate the low, test, low testing soils, and you actually decrease the high testing soils. So now you're, you don't have, every, everything's almost like getting balanced, okay? And that's a real problem. Not all soils behave, you know, I mean, I've got a line through there, but you can see that if I'm at 100 parts per million, I could have, on a moist analysis, I could have a dry soil test of 100 to 200, right? And if I was at 50 parts per million, I could have a soil test value that was moist that was 50 parts per million, but when I dried it, it could be 150 parts per million. Yes? This is from our soil library. It's all different types of soils, but that's a great question because it all comes down to that clay mineral, right? So potassium in our Midwestern soils, we have illites, and we have smectites, and illites are, they're two to one clays that have potassium locked in between them. Okay, so this is an electron micrograph of some clay. And so 200 nanometers, that, this bar here, okay, that's one five thousandth of a millimeter. Like a millimeter is about the thickness of a dime, so this is, so that, you know, you're looking at one five thousandth the thickness of a dime, not the diameter, the thickness of it. So it's really zooming in pretty close. And so some of our soils, if you think about clay minerals, I think of them as like a, like a notebook, right? Each sheet of paper is a layer of that clay, and they're kind of smushed together. And so this dark one shows here that all of those layers are packed together. So there's, there's a lot of potassium in the inner layer. This, if you, you know, get your notebook wet, then the pages just start to swell and unravel, and that's exactly what happens with clay minerals. And so 
if you have a soil that has a lot of this type of mineral, well, that means there's a lot of places for potassium to, to hide. So you add it to the soil, and it goes into the inner layers, and then those start to collapse. Okay? So I add potassium. It gets trapped by the inner layer, and then I soil test. The soil test doesn't extract potassium from the inner layer. So you add potassium. What happens to your soil test? Nothing. Right? You don't add potassium, and the plants are removing potassium. And what happens to your soil test? Nothing. Okay, because it's getting potassium from the inner layer of the clay minerals. And so this is a huge, huge issue that we're working on. So when we look at a soil test, we can't just look at that soil test result. We have to know something about the clay mineralogy of that soil and the status of potassium in those clay minerals, right? If it's all loaded up, then when you add potassium, it is going to change. Your soil test is going to change. But if it's not, it may not change. So when we, yes? Right. OK, so I wish I had that slide with me. So if you think about potassium and phosphorus are delivered to the plant via diffusion, right? So it goes from a high concentration in the clay mineral to a low concentration in the soil. And the plant pumps that potassium from the soil solution. When it gets dry, you know, if you think about all the soil particles, like if your soil is dry as a bone, the only way for diffusion to take place is through water, right? So as the soil dries, you get more and more air pockets in the soil. And so um, you, could, you could imagine that I have soil particles with a water film that's connecting them. And then when it gets dry, now that water film breaks and there's an air gap. So that means the plant root can't access that soil plant roots in the moist soil, the dry soil can't deliver any potassium. And so effectively, you're shrinking the amount of soil that the plant can mine. And that's what happens. So when you sample, would be more accurate the moist sample. Right, right. So the moist sample does two things. One, it doesn't, it doesn't, uh, all right, we got seven minutes and 38 seconds to get to 10 on this, on this one? OK. Um, so with potassium, it, when you dry that soil, if you're driving that soil test up, it makes you think like you have a higher soil test level than the plant experiences when the soil is moist, right? And so that's another problem, right? So if you're in one of those soils where, where your soil test doubled when it's drying, it's really, you think it's twice as high as the plant does. So that's a big challenge. So <clears throat> this is just an example. This is from Antonio Malarino. He's a, he just retired, but he was a colleague of mine at Iowa State. And he did a lot of potassium soil testing. And so what we see here is on the axis, on the x-axis, we have the moist soil test, K, and then versus relative grain yield, right? And so with a good soil test, you know, when the soil test value is low, the yield's low, and is it gets higher and higher, the yield gets higher, and then it just kind of plateaus off. So this is what real world soil test results look like from crop response trials. And so you can kind of see there's a relationship, but it's like, well, you know, once I get to 200, or at least once I get to 250, then, you know, somewhere in here, 150 or something, you know, maybe that's enough potassium for the plant. So, but it's not that pretty. And if you look at all of those dark circles, those are the poorly drained soils, okay? Now, if you dry that soil sample, and then you do that analysis again, well, this, I mean, I'm not saying this is pretty, but this is uglier, right? There's less of a relationship. And the other thing that's really interesting is all these black lines when the soil is moist are really on the low end of the soil test values, right? And now they shifted over because you dried it, now they're on the high end. And so, you know, that really shows you an impact on 
drying on soil test values. And so in Iowa, they, did, they also looked at some mineralogy, so you can't really read this, but that, that kind of pink color is smectite, right? That's the two to one clays. That's the one, that clay mineral that looks like a mare's tail, like the wet, the wet notebook. And so the more of that soil mineral that you have, the greater the increase is upon drying, okay? So this is, again, is just going from a well-drained soil to poorly drained soil. And this is the extracted potassium increase of dry potassium compared to moist potassium. So a 100% increase means that the soil test doubled when you dried it, okay? If it's 200%, well, it's even higher. 300%, right? I mean, just, it's just amazing how much drying can impact soil test values. So in Iowa, what they did is they said, well, we're just going to pick this value of 100% increase, right? So if you look at the Iowa fertilizer guidelines, the critical level, say, for a moist soil would be 50 parts per million. But for, if you dry the soil, it's 100 parts per million. But that is applied across all the soils. And this is the problem with agriculture, right? You're just always looking at the average. Well, 100% is too low for this Marshall soil, and it's nowhere near high enough for this Webster soil. And so what we're doing in our crop response trials is we're looking at mineralogy. We're looking at the subsoil properties of the soil. We're trying to figure out Besides your soil test, what else do you need to know in order to make a good fertilizer recommendation, right? So we only soil sample, you know, the top six or eight inches of soil. The plant roots grow down four or five feet, and we completely ignore that in all of our current fertilizer recommendations. So we're exploring what's going on underneath the soil that you never sample to help do a better job of interpreting our crop response trials. Okay, so a couple other things that are different about the Radical Lab. So one of those differences is pH. Most labs run pH of your soil. That's like how, how acidic your soil is, and they do that with a water extraction. If you have a soil and it's just rained, you've kind of leached out any salts that are in that soil. And so your pH generally gets, is, is elevated. How, how, many, how many of you sampled soil? You're, you're, you're kind of relatively intimately aware of what happens, right? So in the spring, you start analyzing, you get your pH back, and then it starts getting dry. And you start soil sampling, and you send your analysis to the lab, and the pH keeps getting lower and lower and lower. And that's because as the soil dries, the salt concentration goes up and it drives the pH down. And so what we do, instead of analyzing a water pH, we run our pH in 10 millimolar calcium chloride. So that's about a consistent background salt concentration of a fertile soil. And so the pH in calcium chloride is usually lower than the pH in water, but it's less affected by the environment. Right? I'm not saying pH doesn't go down when the soil dries, but it doesn't go down as much. So you get a much more accurate reflection of the true pH of the soil if you keep a background salt concentration in your analysis. If you talk to any analytical chemist, they'll tell you that pH has to be done in a fairly consistent background salt concentration. Okay? So that's a big difference. Now, you're going to see commercial soil testing labs are going to start switching to 10 millimolar calcium chloride because they know it's better. Okay? They're afraid to do it because customers are, like you all, are used to seeing water pH. But you can convert calcium chloride pH to water pH if you know something called the electrical conductivity of the soil. So we're going to build that into the radical lab so we can do a better job of saying, Here's the pH in calcium chloride. This is the pH that it would be in water if it was not, you know, just washed out of salts or not, or the salts haven't been built way up. So it kind of provides you a better real-world reading of your true soil pH. 
The other thing that we do differently is the way we an analyze phosphorus. Are you thinking everybody needs to learn phosphorus screening tests or the that? That's a great question, yeah. So, um, so generally when you're making a Lyme recommendation, I mean, Illinois is different, but Illinois is about the only state that does it the way Illinois does. Most states, they'll run your, your pH and then they'll run what's called a buffer pH. And so the buffer pH basically tries to decrease the pH of the soil. It's kind of pulling hydrogen ions off the soil, and what it's doing is it's trying to lower the pH, and then the soil is trying to raise that pH. And so the buffer pH is what's used to make Lyme recommendations. Buffer pH doesn't work very well in sandy soils because sandy soils are not well buffered. They, don't, they just don't have a lot of hydrogen ions to to give, and so you generally underestimate lime requirements with sandy soils. So what we're doing is we are, we just started this, we're collecting soils from all over the place and we're actually incubating them with different rates of lime. And so what, we're, what we wanna find out is can we replace that buffer pH, which is again kind of an average approach to doing everything, and find out is there a list of soil properties that we can use to predict how much lime you need to get any specific target pH, right? So we'll build a database, so it's like, I'm farming this soil, here's my pH, you know, from the radical lab, how much lime do I need? And we'll do it not with a buffer, because we are using a buffer right now, but we think that we can do better, and that is getting a big database, so we say, these soils respond this way. These soils respond this way to lime. So we're, we're actually doing that. So you think it'll be um, like CEC, some other soil My guess it'll be CEC, some estimate of organic matter, um, and then it'll be the type of clay minerals. So I kind of think about it as if you, if you kind of know your organic matter, <clears throat> that's where a lot of the pH buffer is. So you can say, all right, this is, this is the CEC that's coming from organic matter, and then you have the mineral cation exchange capacity, and if you know the clay content, the higher the CEC is per percent clay, that means the more two-to-one minerals you have, and that means there's more places for hydrogen to come off and buffer the soil. And so I'm sure it'll be CEC, organic matter, clay mineralogy, and then your target pH. Um, and there's actually a big national effort that is going on uh, right now for all the land-grant universities. Um, and we volunteered to run incubations for all of the soils that they collect. Because what they want to do is use something called calcium hydroxide. It's just it's a way to raise pH real quickly in the soils and then do it for a couple hours. And I'm like, I'm not comfortable with that because then I'll have to come back and explain to you all, here's what we did. And we didn't use lime. We used something else, but this is how much lime you need to add. So I said, we'll do it if you send us moist soil and we'll incubate with different rates of calcium carbonate, which is lime, and then figure out what that exact relationship is. And so they just had a conference call on that um, yesterday. So back to the phosphorus thing, all right? So we, traditional labs, analyze phosphorus with an ICP. So um, when you go on the lab tour, you, you'll see an ICP. Basically, it's a plasma, and it, it basically is like a flame that's about as hot as the surface of the sun, okay? So anything that you inject into that plasma gets obliterated, and and basically you can determine the total elements in any solution that you have. The problem is that plants only take up inorganic phosphorus, okay? They don't take up organic phosphorus, and if you have organic phosphorus in your filtrate, it's gonna be measured with an ICP. So it measures everything. Radical labs analyze phosphorus colorimetrically, and so only the inorganic P is measured. Now I'm not saying that one is better than the other, but 
Almost all crop response trials that were done in the Midwest were done with the Bray P1 uh, extract, okay? And that's a colorimetric analysis. And then when the commercial lab started using Malik-3, Malik-3 is a multi-element extractant, so it's cheaper for the labs to run. And you get calcium, magnesium, potassium, uh, phosphorus, and they even run it for micronutrients, even though it doesn't work for that. But this is kind of a relationship between Malik-3 color metrics. So now I'm not even talking about comparing Bray P1, but Bray P1 and Malik-3, if you analyze them color metrically, give you pretty similar numbers. And I'm comparing that to Malik-3 running on ICP. And this black line is the one-to-one -one line. And so it's a little bit lower than where the data are. But if you added about 10 parts per million, and drew, and drew that line, it would hit most of the data points. And so because universities haven't done crop response work, the only way for them to switch from one method to another is just to do a comparison like this. Well, I mean, it looks like a pretty good relationship. But if you zoom in to you know, 50 parts per million and lower, where you're actually going to be making a decision on whether you're going to apply phosphorus or not, well, now it doesn't look that pretty anymore. And so I could have a, a color metric phosphorus of, say, you know, 15 parts per million, but the ICP analysis could be anywhere from about 15 or 18 parts per million up to 50. That's a big difference. And so when we're doing our crop response work, we'll, we'll compare that to our radical lab results, and then we'll also run that with an ICP, and we'll find out which one does a better job of, of predicting how plants respond. So um, just to summarize real quickly, you know, radical labs use a moist analysis. That's what plants see in the real world. And I think I showed you how important that is for potassium. We don't scoop the soil. We have a consistent mass. The entire geotube is blended before a subsoil is taken, as opposed to just taking a two-gram scoop, right? So we have computer-controlled precise chemical additions, computer-controlled extraction times, computer-controlled filtering times. And so what, how, how many minutes are we at? OK, so we're at 23 minutes. And this hasn't hit 10 milliliters, right? So some commercial labs will say, all right, as soon as I get 10 mils, then I'm going to pull it off for an ICP analysis. Well, this one was done after eight minutes, or after seven and a half minutes. This was done in eight minutes. This has taken over 20 minutes, and it's still not ready. Other labs will let that filter until no more filtrates coming out, OK? And so that goes on even longer. And so remember, the whole time before that's, that extract runs through the filter paper, it's still extracting phosphorus from the soil. Okay, so that's another huge source of error. The other real nice thing is that radical labs, they're all, you know, they're, they're clones of each other, right? They're built to perform exactly the same way because it's all computer controlled. So there's very little variability from one radical lab to another. And of course, then <clears throat> the time doesn't matter when you when you submit your sample, right? In a busy period in a commercial soil testing lab, I mean, they're running thousands of samples, right? Over a 1,000 samples a day. It's an army of people doing the scooping. And you just imagine the errors that are going to occur with you know, people that have limited training. So <clears throat> one more thing before I pass the baton, OK? So the extract that I added was a mixture of this kind of orange colored solution in this blue colored solution, right? So what I added was a purple solution. So I added that to the soil. Only the orange stuff is coming out. So what do you think happened? Do soils have a charge? You know, we talk about cation exchange capacity. So soils have a negative charge, right? So if I add a negatively charged solution to soil, and the soil's negatively charged, well, the same charges kind of repel each other just like a magnet, right? So 
only the orange solution came through. This is positively charged, and so it attaches to the soil that's negatively charged. So like if you had ammonium nitrogen, ammonium doesn't leach in your soil, but nitrate does. Okay, that's just a little added extra, all right? Um, so <clears throat> I hope I've convinced you that the radical lab is a better lab. We analyze a better sample, we do a better job of analyzing that sample. The problem is you get that number and then you're still up against this, right? Um, so without crop response data, it's just another lab. It does a better job, but it doesn't help you make a better decision because you need to know how to interpret that result to figure out how much fertilizer you need to apply. So you heard from me about the soil analysis part. I'm going to turn it over to Tony, who's going to talk to you about crop response. Thanks, Brad. Um, yeah, so the crop response trial efforts are, are, are ongoing currently. Um, uh, I just kind of give you a snapshot here of, of, I would say, the different phases of kind of this evolution. So, you know, we've currently been doing a lot of work um, strategically here on site to the greenhouse, different things where we're pulling soils from fields, controlled environment, you know, controlled labs, controlled analysis and stuff. Nothing that we do in field, nothing that growers or agronomists that you do is controlled per se. When we get out into the real world, when we farm, we have weather and all that stuff. So a crop response, crop response trials are unique in the fact that this, this undertaking, this kind of new venture, takes in account not just fertility response, part per million movements within soils, but all those other things that play into a factor out there. You know, fertilizer placement, strip till, banded, broadcast. How much of a, a weight does that place on yield response? Soil type, huge, huge. We have all the tools in the world to precisely apply different rates based on a lot of information. And when we take this stuff that we've controlled internally and we look at and we push it out into the field, that's that other information we're starting to pull in and, and want to evaluate for better decisions. And that's never really been done before. You know, when we look at the original crop response trials and we, and we look at that map with that range of how much money it costs to fertilize 1,000 acres, you know, they never had that opportunity to take a look at all the spatial variances across farms, okay? So that's where, that's where all these different crop response trial efforts kind of evol evolve into and, and stuff. So I'll talk, I'll talk initially about current trials we're doing right now in field. And there's a, a method to this evolvement of, of where we're getting to bigger field scale trials and, and a bigger draw and, and support. And when we look at a Gen 1 trial, they're small and controlled, they're 15 acres. Okay, they're in field, and we put in a factor that's kind of never been done before in the fact that this is a trial with farmer gear, okay? Big equipment, AB lines, the tools that you as growers and you as agronomists are using. We don't have those here in the, in the back little corner, per se. So this is the stuff that's happening in farms. So we're actually using, you know, AB lines, guidance, control, big applicators and stuff, and you evaluate the challenges and the efficiencies of those tools when you do trials like that. You know, and initially we are still looking, we're still looking at foundation data. How many pounds of P205 does it take to change a part per million? Is it different in the field with that soil type, with weather and natural environments, than that same soil type that we have in the back and we're testing in a lab? How does that change? All right, placement. I, I mentioned it earlier, banded versus broadcast. What's the true, what's the true field efficiencies of a system like that? Okay, all those different products. What's the suite of P and K products you can get in the different analysis, how they're made? Okay, just K2O on its own is one element, but when we look at murate or different 60 and 62, how does it actually change things in the field? Okay, a lot of that's different. Liquid to dry, what's the response to those products and all that? So it gets pretty complicated, but also it offers a great opportunity to look at all of those practices within a trial like this. And when we look at these small ones, they're, they're precisely picked to kind of not look at that variability yet. Okay, we we're aware of it, and we're gonna get to that part, but these ones don't take that into account. And you take a field like this, right, and, and we're strategically picking this 10 to 15 acres, 
Okay, each treatment block is going to move around. Now, these are built custom to fit grower's equipment, okay, based on his width and application. But when we take a look at this, you know, we're looking at 10 to 15 acres in size. So each treatment block's two-thirds of an acre, an acre, give or take, depending on the size. But they are picked to not cover off soil variability. We want a kind of a static soil type within a place of a field. Okay. Now, this is real-world data. This is from a trial. And the first step after we kind of design these trials is we just get an initial soil test. Now, specifically, we're just talking about P-test in this. So we've tested this in the fall. All right. And initially, this sparks an interest for me, agronomically and for, and for Brad as well, where we look at something dense. OK, we're pretty close here. We're only talking 10 to 15 acres. And you walk 300, 400 feet. You know, and you've got this part per million change instantly, that close. And it, and it starts me thinking about, all right, well, what, what are we looking at here? Is there that much variance within that close of a, you know, geography within a field? And we start thinking about other things that, you know, traditional crop response trials never looked at is soil, you know, sampling density. How dense should our sample schemes should, should they be? And, and location. You know, a soil test taken in the wrong spot is a real wrong answer, isn't it? Okay, where you take that soil test in a field strategically makes a huge difference. When you look at a grid sample, perfectly square, 2.5 acre grid, that point is dead center in the middle. How often is it right? How often is it wrong? As in, is that point representing the eight or the 22? Okay, there's, there's a lot of work here that needs to be looked at when we're talking about, you know, precision agronomics and where the sample's taken. And these small trials just, you know, flick the switch on something that, okay, we need to be looking at this more for you as growers and agronomists. Real data graphed out, super exciting, not as exciting as a fancy experiment, I know, but we look at some of these numbers and fine, we, we get, we get a, a readout of this p-test value. So in this trial, we have this initial baseline soil test of P. We then apply a prescription based on your product of choice. Okay, so this was a 10, well, the map was applied on this, so rate pounds per product. But we bring it back. We're looking at precisely just the P205, okay, 40, 80, 120, 160 rates. And we can see we have, you know, three replications of, of each rate. And then because we're doing lots of these trials, regardless of product, we always steer the product rate back to the actual P205 or K20 rate, okay? Just so we have a consistency across all treatments. So we tested, fall applied the product, we spring test, okay? And we get that comparative results. And it should give us an obvious answer. This is some pretty basic stuff. And we see this kind of initial part per million change based on a treatment. But we start to look at the evaluation of, OK, how many pounds of P205 does it actually take to change one part per million? Well, that question actually should be asked with a whole bunch of other questions. What's the soil type CEC? All of those things should, should follow it. It isn't a simple answer. These trials also add another component, OK? we start to look at some of these baseline things, crop removal rates. What's the true crop removal rate when we take a look at this? You know, traditional crop response data is took strips, harvested the whole thing, weighed it, came up with one number, one average of that whole number. Where we can take precision ag and precision agronomics and take uh, two-thirds of an acre and look at, you know, over 200 data points of yield data to start bringing in, even after we edit. Okay, we're editing, you know, transition points and stuff. There's a lot of work that goes into this. So this is pretty powerful stuff that, you know, has never really been utilized in previous trial work and stuff. And this is compounding. This isn't just one site. We look at dozens and dozens of sites, spatially across states and states, different soil types, and start harvesting as much of that information as we can. And we grow them. OK, so now I'm talking about a 10 to 15 acre trial controlled. And now I reach further. OK, I want to bring in the noise, I always call it. So we start looking at full fields, 40 plus acre trials that we're looking at. And yeah, we're, we're still capturing all that original 
you know, data that we have in the small plots, or sorry, in the, the Gen 1 trials. But now we want to look at, you know, soil types, spatial variability, zone analysis. Is a prescription zone where we draw the lines the same for a P recommendation as a K? Should that change? Should a seeding rate prescription be the same zones as a P? You know, that's stuff that we start to bring in to look at with this, okay? And, and then a huge analysis and a huge look at soil testing locations. How do we work together to optimize a sampling strategy as in where do you take the best points across this field to best represent the soil test result that fits the zones or the variability within that field, right? And when we take a look, and I'll just kind of walk you through, I would say, the process of partnering with us on one of these trials, the work involved, kind of the flow throughout a few seasons, kind of the return within this trial effort, especially in these Gen 2 ones. And a Gen 2 is, is, is very much an expansion where we can see, you know, a Gen 1 design strategically picked to kind of, you know, cover off a single soil type. And this farm has lots of variability, and a Gen 2 now basically captures that fieldscape. You, you gotta have at least 40 acres of capacity to work with to give us enough data to kind of build these variability layers into crop response data. And then when we look at a design like this, we're looking at a full field treatment prescription, whether it be P or K in this example. And just to breeze through this, you know, this, this trial process and your involvement, and it's a great opportunity for you to kind of get into your own fields and the own, your own area that you work initially, okay? You get to pick the field, okay? You supply the field of choice or the fields of choice in your geography, the stuff that you're working with, with your growers, with your different practices and stuff, okay? We work and define the zones, soil types, and things like that. We have the ability to even work with you on existing zones. If you have your own lines drawn, We'll, look, we'll work with that, okay? We think this is a great opportunity to test a lot of different things without that. We provide those soil testing points. Remember, where we pick them is strategically important for these trials. Okay, and then we soil test. We take those soil points, we get that initial baseline result through the radical lab. We provide that custom fertilizer prescription unique to that grower, that equipment, that product of choice, Tillage practice, are you a strip till, broadcast? Okay, we provide that custom prescription. We confirm that with a as applied map, and then we get that yield data back on that field. And then we soil sample again, and we process those post-applied treatments, post-applied application through the radical lab. And anything in orange is kind of your workload, and anything in black is kind of our workload. It's a very shared responsibility throughout a year. But the beauty of these is they get efficient. Once we execute that design, once I build it, once we work together, once we start, we just get to farm it, okay? Which is what we're doing out there. But because we've got that template in place, where we've taken those soil points, the treatment rates, we basically test, apply, yield, repeat. And after a few seasons, we know within, a, within an initial season, we start to see numbers that are useful that you can use within you know, your own local data, within your own fields that you've chosen to participate with. So what are we building? So that's just an example of you know, Gen 1s and Gen 2s. But when you take a look at the capacity and the opportunity for all of us, it's the grasp and the breadth of what we can do when we have hundreds of these trials, okay? across the state, across multiple states, across America, where you've got all these Gen 2 trials going on simultaneously, new ones starting, some three or four years down the road, all of that information that starts to be captured and come back. And what this is all going into to support you guys as agronomists and growers is think of it as a fertility resource center. Okay, this is more than just a soil test. This is more than just a rec or anything like that. We think the wealth of all of these trials being able to put into efficiencies of treatment, different product efficiencies, placement methods, all of that stuff that's never really been looked at is essential in supporting how a recommendation is made. It's more than just moving a part per million from this number to this number, okay? In fact, a recommendation for a field 
should have multiple recommendations within it based on, well, that point's over there and this one's over here. That's two different recommendations, right? And we have the technologies and opportunities to do that. So all of that information goes into this. And this is infinite. This is a 10-slide thing that I would put up. But some of the key things that we're starting to look at, and I glazed over them pretty quick, okay, management zones, sampling strategies, all of this goes into this resource, okay? All of this searchable stuff, think of it as a data set, where if you just, as a grower or supporting a grower, wanted to look at the efficiencies of strip till to broadcast, and you've got over 100 sites, and maybe there's 30 trials of each, like that's, a, that's an amazingly powerful tool that isn't available currently, and maybe will never be, where you could strategically tell your grower, or you as a grower yourself could say, you know what? A strip-till banded approach and dry can cut me 30% in application rate costs because it's a more efficient way for P particularly than broadcast. Well, that's a lot better than just buying a $200,000 strip-till rig and hoping to cut your fertilizer bill down, right? Things like that. Shifting from liquid to dry, all those cost inputs, those capital assets. Okay, that's the true value of a crop response trial. Okay, it's more than just fertility, it's the whole system. It's the growers and agronomists and everything you're working with out there, we want to be able to capture and have that available in some type of data set or resource center. So get involved, you know, some of these highlighted points. It's, it's like I said, it's a very customizable thing. You get to work with me directly on a lot of this stuff. Um, it's not, it's a long-term opportunity with short-term results, okay? We will see stuff and be able to offer really great insights within a season. I think that's key to, to, to mention. It's more than just a soil test, okay? It's more than that. We're looking for bigger picture stuff here to start capturing and stuff. And these are simple practi practical protocols that are specific to you and your grower. It's your gear, it's your field, it's your tools that we're basically capturing and helping you with that goes into feeding this. And it's anonymized, this growing database, okay? Your information is your information. When it's collectively housed and grouped, that's a great opportunity for us to extract information, but it's basically confidential in that aspect, okay? I think that's where we're gonna end, and I'm sure we'll bounce back to some questions to that, but yeah, any, any interest in this, you can snap that QR code, it'll take you there, um, kind of start the process of, of getting involved and having that conversation with me. And um, yeah, we welcome, welcome the opportunity to work with you on that. So I think with that, time-wise, I have no idea where we're, we're at. Brian, I know you guys missed half the tour. <laughs> but we'll probably uh, feel some questions, keep it casual. It's really hard to talk about a complex process and, and big national venture like this in just a PowerPoint. So I hope there is a few questions with that. So. All right. Just to quickly summarize this part, it took between seven and a half minutes and a half hour to filter 10 milliliters of liquid, right? That obviously is going to impact your soil test. And that's what, something we eliminate. So hope you all learned stuff. Uh, questions. I know you it was awesome that you guys were asking questions during the presentation. Any questions about the lab or getting involved? Yes, sir. Sir, uh, question for the GFC. Mm-hmm. Do those three things, like the fact that it's fresh fruit fruit versus the green fruit versus the fruit, that those are three things? No, because it's, it's not that, it, um, it's not packed in that tight, right? It's, it's basically just kind of squeezing most of the air out so we have a, you know, enough sample that we can get. It's not, we're not like pushing it down with like 10,000 pounds of pressure or something like that. It's just basically making sure that we get a relatively consistent amount of soil. You know, you know uh, some questions that I've had is, uh, well, it's a moist soil test. Well, sometimes when I'm soil sampling, it's really wet, and sometimes when I'm soil sampling, it's fairly dry. And it doesn't matter that, you know, whether your sample is, is, you know, just, you know, it's wet and you were, you know, when you were first able to start getting cores or whether it's starting to get kind of parched out there, 
the fact that you didn't dry the soil is the only thing that matters. There's no relationship to the percent moisture of the soil and a moist soil test, okay? It's when you actually dry that soil. And, you know, the soils just don't get that dry in nature. You know, even that surface soil years ago, that's bone dry. Well, it's not as, it's still wicking up moisture from the lower part of the soil. So it's not, it's not the same as like an oven dried soil. It's just, you just think that it is. Yes? Yeah, so that, that's a great question. So um, how, how intensely you should sample a soil is probably based first on how intensely you manage that field. But what we're going to do is, um, like two and a half acre grid just doesn't make any sense. It doesn't fit any field scale equipment. But, so I think about like, 120 feet by 120 feet, that's about a third of an acre. 120 feet kind of fits a lot of our ag equipment. So we're gonna go out um, and work probably with uh, John Jones. He's a, a new soil fertility specialist that's gonna be starting at the University of Illinois. He's really, really good. Um, and we will probably look at soil sampling on a one-third acre grid and then taking some of those grids in different parts of, you know, different fields and then sampling much more intensively so we can see how much variability do you have in, in a field or is it a soil type response? You know, it's like if you think about the, the precision ag stuff that came out in like the, early 90s, farmers have historically applied a uniform rate of fertilizer, but some areas of the field are consistently out yield other areas of the field. So if you just take a real simple-minded approach, which is what people did, is that, well, actually the higher your soil test, the lower the yield, right? That's not true, it's just that, you know, when you have a higher yielding crop, you're removing more nutrients, and so the soil test goes down. And as long as it's above the critical level, you know, as long as it's not limiting yield, it'll, it'll keep going down. And so we need to figure out how variable fields are, right? It's, it's like you're asking, you, you're asking me a question that I wish I could give a uniform answer to, but you know, if, you have, if you have soil tests that vary all over the map, but your lowest soil test for phosphorus is 50 parts per million, it goes up to 200, it's like, okay, you got a lot of variability, but you just don't need to be applying fertilizer, right? Um, but if, you're, if your soil test values are low and variable, well, we wanna find out how do you find those lowest yielding areas, right? So you have your, your yield monitor, like we'll come up with a soil sampling strategy in these Gen 2 trials, but the minute we get the crop response data back, well, we're gonna have to relook at that and say, all right, what additional points do we need to soil sample? Because we have areas that are either overperforming based on what we applied or they're underperforming. And we, you know, it's not always gonna come down to that soil test level, right? And I so, would add to your comment, so the, the trials themselves, the Gen 2, are, are very much looking at that sampling point scheme and stuff. Challenge with yield data and stuff is two low yielding spots do not mean the same thing. Right. Same with too high yielding. So cautiously we can look at that, but when we initially design a trial, it has a lot of points. Okay, it covers that fieldscape pretty good. Like Brad mentioned, we'll add some, we'll remove some, but how you come up with a sampling scheme and that strategy is going to be unique to fields, variability, topography. Um, as they get farmed, okay, as we pull data out of them, as we pull nutrients, as we apply nutrients, we start to see, okay, do we have redundant points? Are these three points looking at the same CEC, the same soil site, same elevation? What's the best one to strategically pick to represent that? Okay, can we delimitate two or three? Can I give you a farm of 100 acres or a quarter section and say you only need 10 points and, and farm on with that? Or do you still need 50? We've really got to look at that better to help help 
or, or are there points that are only tested every six years based on another model? Like mm -hmm. there's a lot of opportunity to really dig into that better and do a better job. But I will highlight this point. Probably will never be a good example, right? We can do way, we can do so much better, so much better on, on all this stuff, so. Yep. I mean, we're gonna, we're gonna learn all of this stuff together, right? I, I mean, I, I, I always say, I don't think we have a clue on how to soil sample. <laughs> um, you know, I mean, the idea of pulling up to a point and jumping around on a, you know, hitting the corners of a, of a four-wheeler or something like that is not the same as, you know, your rows are going this way, and if you soil sample perpendicular to the row and you get all of that soil between one or two rows, now it's like if there's previous bands or something like that, it's all homogenized. You know, if you're taking point samples, did you hit the band, did you not hit the band? We're actually working on, you know, the, the top, the, where do you start? You start with a soil sample. Well, so we're doing a lot of research to come up with a better soil sampling tool. And then once we have a tool that we think is better, then we have to figure out, okay, we have a better tool to pull a sample. Now, how do we pull that sample and how many of those samples do we need? I mean, that's, that's something that is ongoing because it's a garbage in, garbage out scenario. If you take four cores and they're not representative of the area, it's a garbage in, garbage out. Yes, sir. Right. Well, is your strip always in the same spot? Okay. Right. Right. It's higher. Yeah. Well, and so the thing is, your plant roots go everywhere, right? So the thing about if you only sample in that strip, you're missing the information on what's going on between the strips. But if you sample like some in the strip and some between the strips, well, is that representative of the whole root zone for the plant? I mean, I don't have an answer for you. I, I, my, my global approach is I want a 30 or a 60 inch strip perpendicular to the row and I'm getting all the soil and then when we run into a situation where, you know, you're farming on a transect or something, and I mean, I got RTK and I, I keep putting that in the same spot year after year after year, that's a great place for us to figure out, is there a better soil sampling strategy for that? I don't know the answer to that question. I, I think don't in think the trials, any, I don't we'll, think anybody we'll look at you know, unique, unique um, growers like yourself if you're gonna be a continuous strip spot. We almost have to take an in and out two separate boxes of out samples and in strip samples. Because you've got to remember, if you're pH issues or you don't, well, you can't put that through strip till, it's a broadcast. So you might have a sampling scheme that's unique for certain nutrients within a fieldscape and some that are unique to, well, I can do P and K with my strip rig, so that gets tested a different way, or those points are specific to that. We don't know the answer, so we kind of grab everything we can, mm -hmm. and we try to find the best best method with yeah. that. But that, those, are, those are things with kind of that collaboration stuff with, can't give you a direct answer on how to sample that farm ideally, but I'm, I'm welcoming the challenge to learn with you on, you know what, this is, we'll take some out, we'll take a bunch in, we'll figure out what kind of response numbers we get. Are we missing something by, by staying in the strip? Like mm -hmm. Brad mentioned, roots are not specific to a 10 inch by 10 inch strip, right? They're gonna go everywhere. So yeah. is there is there low hanging you know is there opportunities to increase yield outside of that strip with yeah. different applications? That's and stuff like. Yeah, well, and that's something to learn, right? Yep. But that's the beauty of doing these crop response trials, um, is that you're working directly with Tony, and it's like you have specific questions in mind. You know, like well, I don't care about pink. I want to do a lime trial. I want to do a I want to do a nitrogen trial we will work with you to develop something that fits your specific questions and then 
eventually when that stuff goes into an anonymized database, everybody gets to learn from it. 